Giorgio, who were you, what group were you with in the World War II? You mentioned the 8th Air Force. What group were you in, and what was your rank? Uh, the second lieutenant. Okay, with what, what group? 145th Bomber Squadron. And you were based where? Well, <laughs> very, we, we moved around. I mean, where about you? Know, where did I take my training at here? Or how that well, were you over in the Pacific? Yes, I was. So, where was your base at? Started out on an island called Pago Pago. It had a long name of it, but we nicknamed it Pago Pago. Mm -hmm. And then we moved further down in the what year, what year did you serve over there? What years were you over there? 42, 43? No, it was 44. 45? 44 and 45. What other islands were you involved with over there? You know, right now, we would jump and stay one, and I don't really remember. Mm -hmm. What kind of plane did you fly then? A B-25. That a bomber? Yes, sir. So you were you went on bombing runs? Is that what you did, or we did more scraping runs and bombing runs. Like where would you go? Would you like soften up an island before the Marines would land? That is correct. Tell we, me, tell me some of the operations that you were involved with over there. Well, what we would do. Those islands were growing up with a lot of overgrowth, and they didn't know what was on the islands. And I flew a B twenty five J model. The J model had two guns on the, each side of the airplane, the about to copy it. The bombardier had a, had a 50 caliber. The uh, navigator had a 50 caliber, two waist guns, and the tail gunner had two. And we would all peel off with all the guns going, just like a weed eater, we would clean up the island. And so you had the gunners on the B-25 shooting? Yes. And then you would come in and drop bombs? No, no. we wouldn't carry bombs so in. So just strafing? We were right on the deck, okay. just like a weed eater, and just you, stuff of flying. And you were the, the, the chief pilot or the captain of the aircraft? Yes, I was the pilot of the aircraft, had a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. Did you by chance go in over Guam or Iwo Jima or Okinawa or anything no. like that? No, I did not. Now, did, did you ever encounter Japanese airplanes in the air, or was that something that the fighters would encounter? Um, I was very lucky. We were always looking for some kind of enemy competition, but uh, I was in toward the last of the war, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a lot of fighters over there, and uh, there wasn't much contest then. How, how many hours or missions did you fly while you were in World War II? We called them sorties, mm -hmm. and I don't really recall how many sorties. I didn't keep count of it. Mm -hmm. And you were one of several young men from Owensboro that joined the Air Force? Yes. Was it called the Air Force or the Air Corps? Air Force. Uh, there were five of us young boys that built model airplanes, mm -hmm. and we all started doing it at a very young age, like, I don't know, 12, 13, something like that. And uh, when the war came about, why, well, I was working at the airport, and he had a WTS program, that's war training service, and I had a deferment. Three of the boys were drafted and they were all in the Air Force flying airplanes. And one of them had mastoid problems and he flunked out. So he went to New York and joined the British Ambulance Corps and went to England and uh, drove an ambulance. And I wasn't that patriotic then, but I gave up my deferment and joined the Air Force because, well, when the war was over, I thought, well, everybody asked me, well, what did you do? I said, well, I worked out here at the airport. I couldn't take that. So I volunteered and joined the Air Force. 
How old were you then when you joined? Do you remember how old you were? I think I had to wait. I was 17 and a half when I gave up my deferment, but I had to be 18, I believe, before they actually took me. Mm -hmm. And so how old are you now? 80? I'll be 81 next month. Okay. So you're just a young teenager going to war, huh? I had never been out of the city of Boynesboro. Was it like a culture shock for you to go around the world, or, or were you ready to get out and do something? No, I was scared to death all the time. I was afraid I was going to be washed out and be made a gunner or something like that because I wasn't very smart. We had to take all kind of tests. We psychiatrists. They would ask if you could kill somebody if you were on a tail end of an airplane, could you pull a trigger and kill somebody? And uh, it uh, it wasn't easy getting through. So did you ever have to shoot a gun like that, or were you just basically the pilot? You didn't have to shoot the, or did you shoot machine guns from where you're at? Or? Oh yeah. yeah, I remember the first raid it went on. Tell me a little bit. Well, we were going to clean up this island and we all peeled off when I was about number three. And we came in and just right on the water. And right at the edge of the land by people had driven stobs down. And they had little boards across them. I know they had tied up boats. And boy, the two airplanes in front of me, they had their guns going in the weeds and stuff was going. And the only thing was on my mind, and I hope I didn't see anybody because I didn't want to kill anybody. And that's the truth. But as time goes by, you get a little more hardened, and well, I don't think I ever killed anybody, but it would have been easier to have done. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I killed anybody, but I don't know. So you flew B 25s. Did you guys fly in formation? Were there a bunch of you, or what? Absolutely. Tell me about it how you take off and who's the flight leader and how that works? Well, you, the first airplane that takes off, he'll make a left-hand turn. The next airplane will cut out in front of him and he'll kind of be slow and you'll get up on his wing. And, you got, and you fly normally three airplanes, three here, three here, three here, three here. And you change positions every once in a while, every 30 minutes because you sit there and look at that airplane and you get vertigo. Now, some people don't know what vertigo is, but if you're sitting here like this, you're looking at two tails, first thing you know, one tail is going like this, or you're getting screwed up, you better change positions. And we used to fly some at night, and you really got vertigo then. The only thing we had was a blue light on top of each wing and a blue light on top of each rudder. And it was just, well, I remember one night, I flew one night mission, and I was so tired when I came home, I could not make it to the, well, my living quarters or my hut. I climbed up in the nose where the bombardier was and went to sleep. Do you fly by your instruments then when you have vertigo? I mean, is that what you're relying on, is the instruments or what? No, you punch your co-pilot. He flies for about 20 minutes, and when he gets vertigo, he punches you. Well, what about when you're in the clouds and you can't see? Aren't you flying by the instruments? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. that's that's not hard to do. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, I mean, uh, I've got over 24,000 hours in, uh, well, corporate flying, we, uh, a lot of it's up in the clouds. Can you tell me what the radio transmission sounded like when you were going on a bombing run? Were you like... Red, red leader to blue leader, or how did you guys talk? We didn't want to break radio silence because it could home in on us, but we had low frequency radios. It wasn't very good anyway, so we flew what we called dead reckoning. Uh, we drew us a line on a map, and the navigator, he, if we were out of the clouds, he would shoot a star or a moon or sun or something and he would give us headings to fly. They wasn't very good. He got us with, we were lost a lot. So you did strafing runs over islands before marine landings, like you well, said? Well, what was going in. It could have been the amphibious engineers going to build a runway or something. In other words, when they wanted cleaned up, we cleaned them up for them. Mm -hmm. 
Well, do you know much about Iwo Jima, the battle on Iwo Jima? Only what I have read. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard that the Air Force bombed Iwo Jima for 72 consecutive days and it didn't do any good. Well. Because they were underground. This is uh, the Japanese uh, knew that even us, when we came in, they were they would dig holes and were underground. So even though, however, we cleaned up a lot of the brush, underbrush or the overbrush, you might say, whereas they couldn't hide when they come out of the hole, they would see them. So maybe maybe we were able to destroy some of the planes on their airfield, you think, or something with the bombings? I mean, 72 days, that's a lot of bombing. Well, I know that they did a lot of good in 72 days because I know what bombing's like because I've been over where it's at. You think they were the same kind of planes that you flew that they were dropping bombs out of on Iwo Jima? Um, they had a Betty, which was uh, their main bomber, and then they had a bunch of Zeros. Uh, the Betty was a good airplane, it was a bomber. And it could have been on the ground. I mean, uh, I don't know what was on Iwo Jima. Were they B-29s probably that were flying over there? When you say Betty, is that what you're talking about? Or? No, the Betty was a Japanese bomber. Oh. Now, were you, did, what was the, did you ever get into a situation when you're doing your missions or your sorties where you were under attack or under anti-aircraft or zeros in the air or anything like that? No, I was very lucky. I was in toward the end of the war mm -hmm. and uh, it was kind of getting cleaned up. I did have one thing that was kind of, well, hair raising for a while we were joining up with a group of a uh, squadron of A-26s and it was going to be a big sortie. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's a kid, 20 years old. I was um, 20 years old the 5th of June and I got my commission the 27th of June. I got an airplane and a crew that's pretty young. And I don't remember how old I was, but uh, we were making up this sortie and we had a heater vent on the right hand side, a heater vent on the left hand side of the cockpit. We never used a heater because they were genital heaters and they blew up. And smoke was coming on the right side and I was trying to get up in formation. I wasn't watching anything in the cockpit. And uh, one of the crewmen in the back end, I think it was a radio operator, said, Sir, I We've got an engine on fire. No, smoke was coming up in the cockpit. And we used throat mics, and all I did is punch the button. And I said, what are you guys doing back there roasting weenies? 20-year-old kid, that's what I said. And uh, I think it was a radio operator that said, no, sir, I said, we got a fire on the right engine. I looked out there, and I had a fire. So I throttled back and rolled out of formation and was out over the ocean and we all had one man life rafts. And I told them to jump and we were about 4,000 feet. So we released all the emergency hatches and everything. I had 972 gallons of 100 octane fuel in that wing. And I knew it was just gonna be a matter of minutes before it blew. And uh, we got down to about 1,100 feet, and I called back there. Just, I said, all oh, you guys out? Radio operator said, they won't jump. They didn't want to jump in the ocean. Man, what are you going to do? So I saw a little island over there, and right at the edge of the island where the water came up, it was kind of smooth. So I just throttled back some and rolled it over, and, and um, I landed on the island there right at the edge of the water and the normal landing speed of a b-25 on approach is 120 mile an hour and i reached up just to pull the mixtures off to kill the engine i looked at the airspeed we were doing 155 and i put it on the ground and we were really rumbling along and uh, i went i just the, the cockpit was higher than the regular part of the airplane, so I just put one foot on the flight deck, one on the radio, 
navigator table and went out to top. And I started to roll off. I looked over and here's the twin rudders. I was afraid if I rolled off, a rudder would hit me, but I went off and it didn't. And I guess I was the last one out. And uh, the airplane rolled maybe uh, oh, a block and a half or two blocks. And it just went up and whoa, and that was it. And uh, there was one guy hurt pretty bad, a tail gunner. They said he went out of the airplane before it actually hit the ground. And the prettiest thing I ever heard in my life was a chuk, 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 chuk. I looked up, here's our sea rescue. When we went out of formation, the squadron called our sea rescue and they must have been pretty close by. Now they wouldn't, it was a PBY, and they wouldn't bring the airplane in, but they brought medics in in life for us. And uh, they took care of everybody. And one of the medics came up to me and asked me if I was okay. And I said, yeah, I'm okay. And he turned around and walked off. And he turned back around again. And he said, sir, would you like to have a drink? I said, yeah, I believe I would. And he had these little bottles of whiskey, you know. And he handed me one. And I was shaking so bad I couldn't get the cap off. And he asked me, he said, sir, would you like me to take the cap off? And I told him, yes. I couldn't even take the cap off of the bottle of whiskey. But we all got home, and they took him somewhere else, and I heard he got okay. So you saved the whole crew? Yes, we were lucky, mm -hmm. very lucky. Did they give you any type of reward for that? Or no, 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 no. I just, line of duty. I started to ditch it in the water, but uh, I knew that we would, some of them would drown, or we'd probably blow up before it got in the water. Were you praying all the way down, or what were you doing? I mean, what are you thinking about? You want me to tell you the truth? I was scared. Are, are you, in, are all any of those men still alive from that plane? Do you stay in touch with them at all? Or? I did for a while. Mm -hmm. um, the last one I was in touch with is dead. Um, but no, I didn't stay in touch with all of them. How about after the war? Were there certain men that you stayed in touch with? Oh yes, oh yes. One of them is in Houston, Texas right now. Uh, he just retired from, well, he was head of a big corporate company. He was chief pilot. As a matter of fact, I almost went to work with him several years ago, flew for him, but I didn't. So you, you have, you, are you proud that you served our country? Yes, sir. Have people thanked you for that? I imagine, yeah. Uh, being in the war, being in the service, it was a lot different than it is today. After the war, until the Iraqi war, no, until after the Korean war, I was rather disappointed in the younger generation drugs and the way they live, their lifestyles and all of that. But since we got Iraq war, some awful fine boys over there. How long did you fly? You don't fly anymore, right? Uh, no, I quit flying. Uh, you mean for a living? Just in general, yeah, just flying. Oh, I quit flying about uh, two years ago. But I'm building an airplane now, but I won't get to fly because I'm sick. Why, why do you have such a love for flying? Where did that come from? I don't know. I was a real small kid five or six years ago. An auto gyro flew over. And I knew then that I wanted to fly one of them. And I, uh, my father was an alcoholic. And we lived in a little house that was three rooms on one side and three rooms on the other side. And our rent was $30 a month. There were five of us lived in these three little rooms. 
and to help make a living when I was in high school, I went to school on half a day and rode a bicycle three miles up a railroad track to the airport. I'd work a half a day for five days, Saturday and Sunday, and I made $10 a week. That was $40 a month. I gave my mother that $10. She'd take $30 of it and pay the rent. That $10 went for groceries. That's how I was raised. Mm -hmm. And you just, as a little boy, wanted to fly someday, and you, you fulfilled your dream. I really did. Was it the Air Force that helped you fulfill it, or were you flying before the Air Force? I was flying before I went to service. As a matter of fact, uh, they gave me 10, they gave all of us students 10 hours in a J3 Cub, and I had already soloed. And the instructor never knew it, and I never told him. And I got the logbook after the war, and it says, student flies as if he's had previous flying experience. Student re re maintains instruction as well. He wasn't a very good instructor. He, I could fly the airplane better than he could. Can you just, as, from a layman's perspective, tell me just a bit about turbulence? I'm curious. I mean, in a small plane, are you? I mean, what's? Should people be afraid of turbulence when they're flying? I mean, it's just what is it? Pockets of air, or what is it? Well, as the air, the sun heats the ground, and the air it rises and it rises, it cools off, then it comes back down. But you can get a hit of the tur over the turbulence, depending on how hot the sun and everything is. Um, I have flown most of my life corporate flying. And when you fly a corporate airplane, you want to, the, your passengers, they determine how good a pilot you are, not how good a landing you make but how smooth the ride you give them. And we've got wonderful radars now. It can be all kind of storm and light and stuff and we can pick our way through there and you can sit a glass of water on a table and never spill a drop. And that's what they want. And I know if I was a corporate, uh, I mean, flying in the back is what I would want. But the big jets, they all have turbulence. You go on a flight and for whatever reason. Well, we have what we call clear air turbulence, and they're formed from different, well, jet streams and things like that. You can't give everybody a, a totally smooth ride. What does a pilot do when they hit turbulence? Do they just ride it out? They can't be pulling anything or doing anything, right? Uh, normally, if it gets pretty good, we slow the airplane down a little bit. It's about like a boat on the water. Uh, we just slow the airplane down a little bit. Or we change altitude. Sometimes we go up a little bit higher and sometimes lower. Uh, most airlines don't fly above 38,000 feet. Uh, the military is up about 50. The company that I flew for right now, we have a Learjet, and it's certified to go to 50,000 feet. And it's pretty smooth at 50,000 feet. I'm going to ask you a question that I ask all the veterans, you know, George, being a World War II veteran and, and an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you? I don't think that the average person realizes what freedom really is. I don't think they feel like what, I'm not talking about my generation, I'm talking about World War One and Vietnam, Korea, what people have done to give this people freedom. What would you tell a young person about the price of freedom? I don't really know. I don't really know. The reason I say that, the younger generation I don't think they can comprehend how lucky they are right now to have what they have. When I grew up, my first automobile, it was a wreck model A. I gave $7 for it. 
my first airplane. I gave $200 for it and was crashed. I'm building an airplane, a home built right now that'll cruise over 200 miles an hour. It's an acrobatic airplane. I've got over $100,000 in it. What does the American flag mean and represent to you? A lot of people have died for it. It's been pretty rough. You're right, they have. A lot of them have. And I think a lot of people don't respect the flag, you know? They don't. They really don't. It means a lot to the veterans, though. It does. Trees of up. I don't really like to talk much about it. Well, no, you know, I tell you, I've talked to over 250 veterans, and and they have seen firsthand, you know, what why we're free, and, and people in our country don't realize it because they've never not been free. We live in a free country, but like Memorial Day tomorrow, a lot of people. Don't well, really acknowledge it. They go on picnics and have a good time, in which I guess is good. Well, they have sales at stores, and you know, the, but you know, the real meaning behind that, or Veterans Day, you know, it's, yeah. it's important that we remember. Well, my film series is called Lest They Be Forgotten. If we don't remember, we're going to forget. Oh, I think it'll be forgotten. Uh, don't get me wrong, I think it was just last year they built the World War II Memorial, you know. In Washington, yeah. Uh, that since it took so long for them to recognize all the World War II veterans, uh, I feel like I just have well, forgotten that. Mm, that took a long time, I know, I agree. I haven't seen a Vietnam Wall, mm -hmm. but I, I don't want to see it. Can I ask now, you, you have cancer, it, it, throat or what? No, it started out with just a little thing here and it's going all down through here. And down through it was here. On, outside on your face? Or no, it was, it was on a saliva gland. It was inside or something? Yes. How long ago did they find that? November the 11th, mm -hmm. last year. How did you know something was wrong? I mean, what, did Every time I shave, I could feel it under there. What, just like it hurt or what? No, just a little lump. Yeah. And I've had seven hours of surgery, 33 treatments of radiation, and now I'm on chemo. Mm -hmm. Nothing has worked. So can I ask why they have chemo going now? I mean, what's the purpose of that? They think it will extend my life two or three months. Mm -hmm. They say I have about four or five months to live. What do you want people to remember about you, George? About your life, airplanes, and... I was a good father. I have a wonderful life. Two wonderful kids. And my daughter has uh, two kids, and my son has three little boys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do they all love flying too, you think, or...? My son, <clears throat> I soloed him on his 16th birthday. And when he got his license, he had to fly a three-legged trip. And each leg had to be 100 miles. And he was flying a little bitty airplane that had a 65 horsepower engine in it. I had a Bonanza that cruised 200 miles an hour. He didn't know it, but follow, I followed him all the way. And whenever he'd land, I'd just play around out there when he refueled and took off. 
And he flew to Terre Haute, Indiana, and after I saw he had Terre Haute made, I pushed the throttles up, went on and landed, and was sitting there waiting for him. And we came in and said, well, Dad, what are you doing here? I said, well, I thought I'd just come up here and buy you lunch. So we had lunch, and he said, well, I'll see you in Owensboro. I said, okay. Well, when he took off, I followed him all the way to Owensboro. Mm. And I told him about years later, he said, well, what would you have done if I didn't even quit and I'd have crashed that airplane in the field or something? I said, I'd have bellied in right beside you. Mm. They all live around here? No, my son's a doctor in Shreveport, Louisiana. And my daughter is going through nursing school here. She wants to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. Well, George, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I ask all the veterans if it's okay with you. I'd like you to, to look. I want you to look into the camera and give me a salute. Could you do that for me from right where you're sitting? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. <laughs>